Hello, everyone, and welcome to what is the third event of a couple of online events that go along with our exhibition, The Architecture Machine, that is currently on view at the Pinakothek der Moderne here in Munich. My name is Philip Schneider, and I'm a research assistant at the Museum of Architecture at Technical University of Munich. And I have contributed also together with uh, Theresa Funkino, the curator of the museum, and Clara Frey to this exhibition. Um, and today we have the pleasure to talk to Daniel Cardoso Vlach, who is originally from Bogota, Colombia, um, and now lives and does his research in the USA. He holds a PhD from uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he graduated on the subject of uh, computational design and is now an associate professor at Carnegie Mellon University, um, where he is directing the master's program in computational design and co-directing the computational design lab. Um, in 2015, he published, um, among other um, publications, a book titled The Builders of the Vision, Software and the Imagination of Design, which is an intellectual account on the history of computer-aided design technologies. Uh, he also published in related journals such as Architectural Research Quarterly or De Arc, um, where he explores computational design practices from a non-American and non-European context. And he's spoken at related conferences such as SIGGRAF, which is a, a big computational design conference. Um, before that, he has worked as an independent architect and as a consultant for computational design at Gary Technologies and Cohn, Peterson and Fox. Um, but what exactly is it now that links Daniel to our exhibition? Um, before Daniel will give a presentation, I would quickly introduce his sketchpad reconstruction that is also part of our exhibition. So if you go into the museum, the first thing you will see after entering the exhibition space in the first, within the first uh, chapter, say, of our exhibition is this um, reconstruction of Ivan Sutherland's sketchpad application from 1963. Um, it was Ivan Sutherland's PhD dissertation at MIT also. And Daniel not only recreated um, together with his team the software of Sketchpad, but also the, the working logic. Um, so as you can see here, this is Ivan Sutherland in front of a huge machinery that was connected to the TX2 uh, mainframe computer at MIT. And you would operate this uh, drafting or design program by means of a um, set of buttons here to the left and the light pen that Ivan Sutherland is holding in his hand that he would um, orient on the cathode ray tube monitor and by this entering um, commands to, to draft lines, circles, but also a more bit more complex or kind of parametric um, constellation of um, drawing elements. And now I would hand it over to you, Daniel, to give your presentation. So I would stop, stop sharing my screen so you can start. Thank and you. We have uh, time for some questions first by me and then by the audience, obviously. Great. Um, so let's see. Can you see my slide? Yeah, I can see it. That's great. It. Um, thank you so much, Philip, for the introduction. Uh, I think I can cut a couple of slides from my presentation <laughs> after <laughs> your nice context uh, of the project. I also want to thank Teresa uh, Fancano for the invitation to uh, showcase the software reconstruction of Sketchpad in the show. And I only wish that I could uh, have visited the exhibition because it looks really fantastic. Um, so yeah, as, as Philip mentioned, I'm an architect, uh, but as a scholar, my work has focused on exploring and understanding the history of computer-aided design systems. And, and I'm very interested in, in understanding how early CAD researchers um, in government-funded technology projects, many of them at universities, imagine design and how, how the technologies that they developed reflected particular 
intellectual, cultural, but also disciplinary concerns. And how these, these systems constitute a kind of infrastructure that we continue to, to, to employ today in the practice of design in architecture, but also in engineering fields and, and in our creative practices. So today, I think uh, we'll, we'll focus specifically on, on the um, project of reconstructing these systems or the project of thinking historically about these systems through a project that I call an experimental archeology span of CAD um, that I've been conducting uh, in conjunction with students at the Computational Design Lab at Carnegie Mellon. And the idea here is simply to think of CAD systems as historical artifacts through reconstructive, emulative, and speculative lenses, right? So the presentation today is sort of based on the notion that CAD systems are interesting, <laughs> that they are worthy of historical analysis, that they're worthy of uh, social technical inquiry as well, and that they play important roles in shaping the labor and the experience of many architects, engineers, and other designers, and everyone here who is an architect and, or an engineer knows exactly what I'm talking about, right? They, they, these systems can be seen to embody a theoretical, but also an aesthetic commitment about the designing and building practices that they are meant to support. And I think that's an interesting um, uh, uh, point of departure for, for a scholarly analysis. So this is, of course, a perspective that, that has been explored in, to some extent by scholars in this field. Uh, Philip already uh, kindly mentioned my book, Builders of the Vision. There's other scholars, other researchers who have been thinking about these questions. About what do simulations mean in the context of architectural practice? What does uh, interactions uh, among many actors in a construction or design context mean for the practice of design and so on? And on this slide, I'm, I'm showing a few examples of that uh, sort of emerging trend in architectural scholarship to focus on, 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 on these questions, to focus on, on these infrastructures. And one question that I think is important here is, what, what should we focus on, right? Like what, what are the interesting questions to ask about software in architecture? Shall we, shall we focus on describing the, the social worlds where these systems originated? Shall we focus on, on, on thinking of the material histories uh, of these technologies, revealing their physical substrates and their effects? Or should we look at the, at the, the impact or the repercussions of these technological projects on specific sites of practice. Um, I think any, any, any valuable answer will be a combination of these, of these perspectives. And I think that media theorists, architectural historians and theorists and people in fields like STS um, do offer a bunch of uh, valuable approaches to answering those questions. Today, I would like to discuss a specific approach to addressing this question, which draws from this ongoing project that I mentioned to look at CAD systems as historical artifacts and as social technical artifacts. Um, so by thinking of an experimental archeology span of CAD, what I'm trying to get at is at a more intimate eng engagement with the software itself. Instead of focusing on archival materials or interviews, oral sources and documents, um, I think that we may gain invaluable insight into how these technologies work if we focus on how they are actually, um, uh, uh, if, we, if we sort of approximate their material dispositions, their gestural dimension, their sensual aspects. Um, and I think that this is an important perspective to build in if we are, uh, as I think we should, interested in looking at software as a primary material in architectural research and architectural practice and scholarship. Um, so um, I will not offer like an in-depth journey into this project, um, but rather try to kind of outline the boundaries of the project, why I think it's interesting and show some of the, of the current uh, work that we are doing 
um, with a focus on the regimes of visual and material production that these technologies have elicited. Um, the first element of this, of this project is software reconstruction, as I mentioned. Um, we started working on software reconstructions in 2017, um, particularly in the context of an exhibition that I uh, curated at the Miller Gallery here at Carnegie Mellon, um, looking at the emergence of, uh, sort of multidisciplinary aesthetic linked to computation that, um, that uh, sort of affected the way we think about architecture and design and our fields. And the idea of software reconstruction has to do with the idea of approximating some of the earliest CAD technologies by prototyping them using modern languages and hardware. And here I draw inspiration from well-established practices of experimental reworking in archaeology and the historiography of science and technology. So experimental archaeology is actually a term that people in these fields uh, have used to talk about research methods aimed at reproducing the material conditions of specific practices and processes. More recently, since the 1990s, um, historians of science and technology have also started to, to do experimental reworkings as a complement to textual analysis and as a method to, to, to illuminate gaps in archival documentation, right? Which for obvious reasons, typically overlooks sensual aspects of scientific practices, such as smell or touch. And here in this slide, we see the work of um, Lawrence Princip and collaborators. It's one of the historians who has uh, looked at this uh, more intently over the last uh, couple of decades. In, in his case, he's interested in alchemy, right? So part of the work of this, of this group of researchers is to reconstruct um, experiments in alchemy from uh, texts uh, from the 15th century. So in this way, this type of software, uh, this type of reconstruction can offer a richer portrait of the material and social conditions surrounding scientific and technological production. Um, perhaps closer to our world as architects and as designers is the world of uh, media archaeology, which is uh, to, to, to cite Jussi Parika, the, one, of, one of its key advocates, is an undisciplined discipline, uh, which has sought to enrich the analytical repertoire of media scholars by recovering and recontextualizing media artifacts and by reflecting on, uh, quote unquote, the regimes of memory that they elicit. And those are words by Susan Sobchak. In a similar vein, or inspired by some of this work, recent work in human-computer interaction has started to enliven material practices of early computing, incorporating them into renewed and uh, sometimes feminist accounts of the history of technology. In this case, on the screen, we see the work of uh, Daniela Rosner, um, Making Core Memory. It's a, a wonderful um, uh, staging of the kind of the material production of early memory panels for mainframe computers, which is a practice that she investigated through oral, oral um, sources, oral histories, but also by reenacting the practice of making a memory panel. Um, and I recommend you look at this work, it's quite interesting. In our cases, other researchers have also revisited through playful prototyping salient artifacts in the history of cybernetics. Here we see an installation by Paul Pangaro, which reconstructs Gordon Pask's famous Colloquy of Mobiles installation, which is an, an important, uh, let's say a landmark in the history of architectural responsiveness, um, presented first at the 1968 Cybernetics Serendipity exhibition in London. So what Paul and his team did was to study the documents and develop a new version of this responsive installation. Um, and the results were quite interesting. The installation is actually now um, on display at the Pompidou Centre uh, in Paris. So from my perspective, well, from, from the perspective of our project here, software reconstruction shares with these works an ambition to, to, to thinker with the past, to, to work with the past in a way that 
departs a little bit from archival documentation and and um, and verbal accounts, right? And instead, to try to represent that past in a way that the materialities and and and, and the the tactilities of that past are made visible or tangible, right? Um, the idea is also to to yeah to take distance from verbal accounts that describe an object and try to focus on 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 the object itself. So it's a sort of performative it's a performative artifact of historical inquiry. If 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 I if that makes sense. Um, particular to this project of software reconstruction that we've been uh, developing is a specific concern with reflecting on the gestural and visual repertoires enabled by design tools. So how did we see, how did we design, how did we imagine design through computers um, in, the, in the past? What we see on the screen is the reconstruction of Sketchpad, which is currently at the, um, at the um, the architecture machine exhibition in Munich. Um, and as Philip already mentioned, this is the first interactive graphics program developed by Ivan Sutherland as part of his PhD in electrical engineering at MIT in the TX2 machine, which is uh, this massively large computer um, that was also the first interactive computer ever developed. So before the TX2 machine, computers existed, of course, but they, they were, they were, you had to go with the punch cards and or, or with the paper tape and let the computer do, do a work and come back after, after a few hours or next day or the next day to, to compile or to, to check the results of your computation. The TX2, the TX2 machine was the first computer that enabled real time interaction, so to speak, and therefore was kind of the, the, the thing that made projects like Sketchpad happen. Um, so um, it is, of course, a milestone in interactive computing and computer graphics, right? So it's not only the first CAD system, it's also the first interactive computer graphics program. So it's massively significant. Um, and, um, and remarkably, it also created the language of, that we continue to use to interact with computers in order to, to, to to model and to design, right? Particularly notions such as constraints, right? The idea that you can not just draw, but also create associations between different uh, geometric elements was already part of, of Sketchpad's proposition. And it's one of the functionalities that we, that we um, uh, try to approximate in our reconstruction. Um, I should say that the aim of software reconstruction, as I see it, is not to replicate the original hardware and software systems. So this is not, this is not an antiquarian project, um, because that would be a different kind of project. Like we would end up with a sort of uh, Madame Tussauds museum filled with uncanny glass-eyed lookalikes of, of, of software artifacts, right? We don't use mainframe computers. We, we don't spend our time uh, looking in the black market of CRT monitors to find the exact way of uh, reproducing the, the hardware. The hardware. Um, and we don't rewrite programs in assembly language. Um, we think that the idea of a replica is interesting, uh, but I think that the, the, the humbler and more agile technical repertoire of software reconstruction as, as uh, expressed in these projects is well suited to our goal of um, getting closer to the experience of using these technologies interactively uh, to enact some of the key aspects of their interactive logic and some of their key visual, gestural, and ergonomic signatures. Um, this is another reconstruction that we developed is the Kuhn's patch, which was a pioneering mathematical technique to calculate surfaces um, a, a three-dimensional surfaces, right? So it's actually like the first, the first parametric interpolation technique ever implemented on a computer, right? So this is an antecessor to to NURBS and to to the kind of work that we do today in softwares like Rhino uh, and Catia. And it was developed by Steve Koons, who was a mechanical engineer um, and also one of Ivan Sutherland's advisors uh, at MIT. 
And I, I, I like to show it because um, the Kunstpatch was a massively important um, uh, piece of software that really managed to attract an incredible amount of attention uh, for computers to become these universal design machines, right? Um, Kunstpatches were photographed, animated, they circulated in research and industry circles through books, films, and research reports in the 60s and 70s, and they actually created um, a community of researchers um, around the notion of computer-aided design. And I write about this in detail in my book, um, where the personality of Steve Koons, within the context of the CAD project at MIT, uh, played an important role in defining what we understand today as computer-aided design. He was not a traditional mathematician or academic. He was a self-taught uh, uh, scientist, designer, mathematician, photographer. Um, but also, and this is where I emphasize things a lot in, in, in the book, he was a technological storyteller. He was someone who was able to capture a vision for the role of computers in design as a sort of uh, partner or collaborator in the, in the design process that was very influential to his students, including Sutherland, and that created a new, a new way of thinking about design through computation. Um, and these are some photographs of the software reconstruction of the Kunstpatch. These are from an exhibition in, in Vancouver as in the context of SIGGRAPH um, and uh, just as, as illustrations. I will briefly show a couple other uh, reconstructions that we are actually finishing now. This is a reconstruction of Urban 5, which is an experimental CAD system developed by Nicolas Negroponte, also a student of Kunz, um, in, uh, in 1967. And what is interesting about this one is that Negroponte and his team, um, they were interested in uh, natural language processing. So they wanted a CAD system that you could speak to or, or like write in English and the system would understand that and then generate solutions that fit with the description of your work. So, so this was a very difficult reconstruction to make in part because it, it never actually worked in reality. So we had to take decisions, let's say uh, decisions of between archival and curatorial decisions about what to reconstruct, how to best represent and make available for discussion uh, such a project. This will be shown in an exhibition in Montreal um, in next year. And this is also uh, another recent reconstruction is the uh, CISP project by Chris Yesius. Uh, uh, Yesius was a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon in the early 70s. And he was influenced by the work of Christopher Alexander and Noam Chomsky about um, uh, grammars and rules and ways to sort of ideas about generative design at the intersection of constraint management and computation. So he created a system. He, he formulated a system theoretically. He never actually implemented, uh, but it's documented in many of the papers and reports and on his own PhD dissertation. So we took those documents and we created a version of this system, which I think is, we can see it as the first uh, generative system for urban design ever developed. Um, I realize we're kind of a little short of time, so I'm going to go kind of quickly over the next few slides to show you how, aside from reconstruction, we are also working on the notion of emulation and speculation as a way to connect these histories with uh, more prospective engagements with technology. Um, and this is a project that I have been working on in conjunction with a team at uh, the University of California and Yale University here. Uh, through a platform for emulation called EC, which is emulation service, no, em emulation software infrastructure service. And the idea of this infrastructure is to provide a distributed network for emulation where you can uh, theoretically run any software system that you have because they will have a library of operating systems and you can sort of reenact any system that has been, let's say, commercially available. So this would not work for systems like the Kunstpatch and Urban 5 and Sketchpad, because those were 
uh, built in assembly language for hardware specific contexts. In this case, when we're talking about software starting in the, in the mid 80s and, and, and early, early 90s, we have collections, we have archives, and we can actually explore these systems. We can reopen these files. And this opens a lot of interesting questions from the perspective of preservation, um, curation, but also pedagogy and, and, and history of architectural production. Um, I won't go into detail except to say that I'm really excited about this project. We are finishing a paper for CSCW where we talk about a pedagogical experiment where we uh, analyze the interfaces of a number of CAD systems and developed um, a sort of a close reading analysis of software, um, of a software system. The last part, and I don't want to go too far um, beyond the 20 minutes that we discussed, is the notion of speculation. And it's the place where I like to make an argument about the value of historical analysis in the context of prospective technology design. And I will briefly illustrate this with one project, uh, which is a reconstruction which connects the notion of reconstruction with the notion of speculation. And it's a reconstruction uh, developed by um, Eric Ulberg at our lab um, of Harold Cohen's Aaron project. And many of you I'm sure know about Aaron. It was an autonomous drawing robot uh, uh, developed by an artist, uh, Harold Cohen. And Eric, the, the, the student who developed this reconstruction was really interested in, 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 in how this robot made drawings. They, they looked actually quite beautiful and interesting. Um, and so he started to reconstruct the, 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 the algorithm that Cohen used in order to draw the systems. And he discovered, Eric discovered that, that the, the process in, in reconstructing Aaron uh, the, the, in the trial and error process of fine tuning this, this, this little robot, it was, it was sort of craft, he discovered that Cohen was sort of craftsman, a computational craftsman. And that thought inspired Eric to develop uh, um, a way of interacting with computational representations in a way that on the one hand created drawings that felt uh, sort of human, that felt uh, like developed like, like non-deterministic way by, by a computer, but at the same time that were the result of a craft, um, of a kind of engagement with computers similar to a craft, like a trial and error, sort of difficult, uh, non-frictionless interaction with the computer. In this case, he's working with neural networks um, and this, the system that Eric developed allows users to control the weights of the, of the neural network manually, which is, and it goes counter the notion of neural networks, and then play with those filters in order to, to encounter or to develop different results. So by adjusting the different kernels or filters of the neural network, the user can calibrate the tool to respond to a particular drawing, uh, to the features of a particular drawing. Um, and yes, we can, we can go into it, but I'm also happy to share the, the, the publications that have come out of this project and the previous projects. So we have more time for, for conversation. Here we see one of the results. Um, uh, again, combining, combining a sort of historical perspective with um, contemporary technologies in order to reimagine the ways in which we as designers or creative practitioners interact with computers. That uh, is at the root of the, of the questions that we are, we are asking. So just to conclude, uh, I'd like to step, step back a little bit and, and look at, at the methods that we discussed, reconstruction, emulation, and speculation um, as potential methods at the intersection of architecture, computation, and design to, to, um, to unpack the historical specificity of technologies, but also to develop new approaches to, uh, to, to, to new systems. I think, I'll briefly discuss a couple of a few implications that I see or that I have sort of encountered in the process of developing this work. I think that as artifacts of historical inquiry, um, these reconstructions have been very successful in enlivening 
certain ways of seeing, of touching and designing, right? Of representing these ways of, of, of making drawings, of making models. Um, and, and so I, th I think that there's a great potential here to reconcile CAD systems with, with that historical aspect, but also to sort of reflect on their aesthetic potentials, right? Um, from another perspective, as a, as a scholar of technology myself, um, reconstructions and emulations are helpful devices in a, to understand the decision making behind these systems that we are that we're describing. We are, we're able to experience aspects of the logical and material constraints that their authors confronted. Um, as scholars of design and architecture, I think it is really a, really a great way of approximating the experience of using these systems, allowing us to consider the tacit knowledge of their operation uh, and adding nuance to our reading of, of, of the historical practices that inform architecture and engineering and other practices. Um, and finally, as from a pedagogy perspective, as educators, this work has been really interesting because it's been one way to introduce students not only to the history of these technologies, but also to basic concepts of interaction, of programming, of physical design in ways that open avenues for, for tool making, for design tool making. Um, so in this space, architecture coexists with, with historical sensibilities uh, um, and technologies and scholarly research coexists with hands-on engagement with, with systems, with present uh, technologies. We can also demystify past innovations and rethink the contemporary context. And these are directions that I believe are important more generally about architecture and design pedagogy uh, and that might facilitate um, better, more reflective engagements with our practices um, and our uh, research. And with that, I finish. I, I'd be excited to hear your thoughts and to try to address some of the questions that arise. Okay. Thank you very much, Daniel. That was a very interesting uh, and detailed presentation. So I'll go back to quickly um, sharing my screen so you can see something on the screen. So, and before we open um, the questions to the audience, maybe we could um, go a little bit more into detail first about the the sketchpad reconstruction itself, but also about the, maybe the future of reconstructing software. Mm -hmm. So um, as you said, when reconstructing a such software, you're acting on the interface of one, be it architecture, mechanical engineering, um, or some other field that needed a CAD program, but also um, on the subject of programming itself. So really the hardcore uh, writing of a program um and history so digging through archives maybe as you mentioned but i think what would be interesting is knowing um what especially for the for the sketchpad reconstruction what task was it that was maybe the most difficult um or the the, the most time consuming when you wanted to to bring the program that ivan sutherland here um constructed to a new device like this tablet and linking to to another new device like like uh, this this button field here. Great, yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, I think that the most difficult part of it was to decide what to leave out. Right, um, Sketchpad was a very sophisticated piece of software for the time, but algorithmically and technically, it's quite simple for contemporary standards, and this speaks to the layered nature of these technologies, right? So instead of having to work with registers and sort of coding directly uh, on, 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 on machine, on assembly language for the X2 computer, we were using um, basically Java and JavaScript to sketch these, these interactions. And those interactions, and, and these are languages that are at a much higher level of abstraction than, than, than the languages Fortran and, and, and hardware specific registers that Sutherland had to use. So from a technical perspective, it was it was easy. It was more, I think the challenge was more to kind of select, curate what parts of, of the software would be more productively reconstructed 
in order to determine or to, to approximate the experience of using it, to highlight its key innovations. Um, and, uh, and that was a process that took a little bit of time back and forth with um, uh, people who actually knew the software. So I was in conversations with Robin Forrest, who's one of the um, students who were at MIT at the time, Tim Johnson, who collaborated with uh, Sutherland in, in Sketch, but they offered a lot of kind of practical advice and, and suggestions about what was important. Same thing with the interface itself, right? The TX2 machine was a huge machine meant for so many tasks, right? So if you look, if you compare those photographs uh, between our reconstruction and the TX2, so our reconstruction is a bit of a pared down, simplified sort of um, a cleaned up version of those interface elements that were essential to the software itself. So there's two knobs instead of four and there's the keypad has less keys and so on. So, so it was, it was, it's a reconstruction in the sense that it, but it, it like as a reconstruction, it also entails a, a reinterpretation of the system and a sort of curatorial or editorial, let's say, uh, approach to, to what will be reconstructed. I know that helps <laughs> question a little yeah. bit. I think it does. Yeah, I think it does. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and I think, I mean, if I can catch myself um, trying to draw different shapes on, on this um, device and I can see other people when the exhibition was still open, um, also engaging with the software. So I think you did a great job in recreating this, which presented in an exhibition now would probably be overwhelming to, to the visitors. Um, people do, do engage with it and try, try different things. Um, and another question that I would have, and maybe afterwards we can give it to the audience, is um, how do you think that um, the value of reconstructing software would change? Because we can see here a program that was um, a dissertation, so it was very well docu documented. And as you said, you had good, uh, you had persons to talk to, um, mm -hmm. that you count um, how it was developed and how it was used. But if we now look at um, the timeline of software, uh, when software moved from being subject to, to just research uh, because it was so new to actually becoming commercial and the aim of the software being not creating something new or, or maybe creating something new, but at a different pace without the same documentation. Um, so if you look at, I don't know, Auto, AutoCAD or 3 ds Max, um, Archicad, Revit, and those are all written in newer programming languages. Um, so how yeah. affect the reconstruction process and how, how would the value change? Yeah, my sense. That's a, that's a great question that, that has been kind of circling my head for, for a mm. couple of years. I think reconstructing something like AutoCAD is not very practical and Luckily, because we have uh, institutional archives, um, we can actually access the software itself, which is impossible with systems that were developed for mainframe computers, or it would be really impractical, right, to try to actually emulate something like Sketchpad using the, the right system. It would be really expensive. You would need an entire sort of museum to just have the TX2 computer, right? But through I, I, I believe that through distributed emulation platforms like EASY, it will become increasingly possible for researchers, scholars, architects interested in the history of these technologies to access directly the system itself. So instead of having to study the code and reconstruct it, you will have to, you will log into an online sort of platform select the operating system and uh, download or open up the software itself from an institutional collection. I think that's very promising. That's very practical. It has limitations, right? It doesn't address the, the gestural, et cetera, aspects of the, of, the, of the project, but it will, it is already starting to yield important benefits for, for research and, and, and scholarship. Also, because this isn't like, like, you know, 3ds Max or, or Revit or AutoCAD, these are thousands and thousands of, of, of lines of code, right? These are massive projects compared to the relatively uh, small projects like the ones I was discussing, right? Like Urban 5 and, and, and CIS. These are 
there's a few thousand lines of code, right? And it, it's it's doable. You can you can do it in an agile way. Yeah. But but your question also opens an interesting an interesting question, like what what would happen if we were to kind of creatively sort of subvert something like Revit, right? And say like, okay, like taking Revit <laughs> as an example, like do do an anti Revit or something like that. I think that would be <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> Yeah, probably probably a lot a lot of coding work though too, and and uh, understanding and looking through the code itself. Um, yeah. As you said, you have literally a, a book of code in front of you. Yeah, yeah. So the focus is shifting more towards trying to conserve the operating systems that um, got more and more popular yeah. um, through the years, uh, instead of reconstructing the the program. Definitely. And there's great there's great archives like the CCA for example in Canada they have fantastic software collection universities like ours also have it. and that that will become increasingly useful I do think that reconstruction will continue to play a role in exploring earlier systems systems that that were never commercial in the first place yeah. but that were important historically or conceptually to develop what later became an industry, right? So this is like a yeah. bit of the prehistory of the industry, what we're looking through reconstructions. Yeah, yeah, I understand, sure. So say if you wouldn't have recreated Sketchpad, um, probably a broad audience wouldn't have known that all of this um, crazy CAD market that is now has now evolved up until now is originating from a such application. Yeah. One, one last question maybe, um, because um, this is not wasn't really the focus of your presentation, but still, um, it is interesting and also kind of part of the exhibition in forms of the, the architectural software timeline. So you have worked at Gary Technologies and Con Peters and Fox. So before actually going into research, you have worked as a computational designer and you probably have um, worked with the, the programs that we are exhibiting like Grasshopper, Revit, AutoCAD, things like this, yeah. and also maybe scripted your own um, plugins on this so how did how did this affect your later research hmm. what, really as a computational designer that's a great question um yeah well the, my engagement with gary technologies was kind of developed in conjunction with my phd research so when i went to gary tech i was already interested in how software was restructuring kind of relationships within architects and engineers and so on. So I was, I was part of the team, but I was also um, studying what was happening in, in a way that was almost ethnographic, right, to, to, to describe the context of, of what I saw and how what I saw compared to the narratives about uh, technological design that I had seen in the early days in the archives and also in the in our contemporary world of, of computational design. Um, I think having having the technical understanding of the systems, having having worked as a as a yeah as a computational designer in places like, like those two and teaching those technologies made me more interested in in sort of understanding their origins and uh, um, to sort of highlight the continuities that I saw, right? Like we tend to think of, uh, you know, parametric modeling as something that started 10 years ago or 15 years ago, but in reality, the, the very concept of, of, of a relational model was, was original to the earliest um, uh, CAD systems, right? And, um, and, and realizing those continuities and highlighting them, I think can give us a, um, a better vantage point to, to think about our current practices and about how or in which direction we want the field to move towards, right? Do we want to highlight novelty all the time or do we want to realize that we are invested in a project that has 60 years or more in the making, right? And, and, and as, a, as, a, as a scholar myself, I think it's important to, well, I, 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 I relish on on, on seeing those continuities and on making those continuities a little more visible. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the answer. Um, but I think I've asked enough questions now. So maybe if there are some questions from the, for, from the audience, um, you could either post them in the, in the chat section or you just unmute yourself and speak up. 
Um, so I encourage you all to, to ask Daniel some questions while he's here. Uh, I do have a question. Yes, Philip. please. Yeah, yeah I'm Bernard. Uh, Daniel, thank you very much for this mm -hmm. enlightened lecture. I am one of the exhibited in the exhibition in Munich. And uh, as you know, the, the, the bubble is now archived in the Technical Museum in, in, in or Architectural Museum in Munich. Before we already had a project with the Deutsche Architekturmuseum, the German Architecture Museum in Frankfurt, where we tried to um, archive it. And our uh, very ambitious, uh, or our ambition was that we archive not just uh, the images or the models, but we archive the process, the process mm -hmm. where the original design happened, which was an alias wavefront. And uh, then we, so we bought hardware. We found a Silicon Graphics workstation uh, of that year uh, of 1999. And we tried to install the software and finally we didn't make it because we didn't have the license keys. And so, so we failed. We, we still have the workstation here. As I understand this, this project you have, you would be able to simulate or emulate uh, systems like Silicon Graphics on, and maybe then software like Alias Wavefront. But how would you tackle the, the problem of the licenses then? Yeah, that's such a key question. We, we ran into similar problems in doing our little research project on emulation in the, in the spring. Um, the, what, what, what I think things are moving, the direction things are moving to, I think is to create an equivalent of fair use for software um, systems. Right now, I'm, I'm part of a conversation or a project that is based on Harvard called Building for the Future. And it's tackling these precise questions. How do we archive architectural, like born digital architectural materials? And one of the questions is the question of, yeah, of, of the proprietary nature of of the software systems that we are using. So I don't, no one has a solution. What I can tell from those conversations is that there's no solution at this point, but what I see happening is a growing consensus that we have to find a sort of fair use policy for these things. Fair use, I don't know if the concept is as extended in, in Europe as in the US, but fair use applies to texts and archival materials that scholars or, or museums or institutions um, uh, can use without having to deal with issues of copyright when the, the purpose is, yeah, scholarly analysis, uh, disseminate, like, uh, dissemination for nonprofit purposes and so on. So I think that's the direction we need to push companies. And as part of this group, there are representatives of, well, of Autodesk and of other companies um, who I think are pretty much on board with that idea. So I think that in the near future, hopefully there will be a, a, a more kind of universal understanding that we need to facilitate access to, 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 to software or to digital born architectural information, even when that involves using proprietary software. Um, so yeah, I think it, for, for the particular project that you mentioned, and by the way, I know your work and, and thank you for coming to the talk. It's, it's great to, to see you. Uh, um, it's not I, think, I think it would, it would make sense to try to approach directly the, the departments of uh, media in these companies and request for a specific kind of fair use permission to, and then hoping that they will kind of, um, give you one then we should definitely keep contact and make sure you're you're trying to <laughs> to emulate alias wavefront as well because yes, some of the very early projects by greg lynn as well had been made in alias wavefront so i think uh, there, there would be yes. some interesting diamonds uh, to find wonderful yeah yeah we did some early maya uh, emulation last spring so yeah i'd be very happy to continue the conversation and, and, and try to serve as a bridge between these projects and, and, and your efforts. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Franken, for the question. And I, I'm sure the, the museum would be glad to provide a collaboration platform um, 
to link you to, uh, to, uh, to, to work on this. Are there any other um, questions from the audience? Um, Philip, can you see me? Yes, and we can. Okay. Hear, I think. Okay, great. Hi, Daniel. Um, I have one last question, which I think has been kind of covered, but I wanted to clarify this a little bit more because we're obviously thinking about uh, collecting digital archives at this point. And one of the questions that we've had over the last two years as we were looking into um, what to show in the exhibition is also whether or not we should try and include a documentation of what you earlier called like the tacit knowledge that is part of software. Um, because we do often, I think, encounter the problem that we see the software and we see the early projects, but we don't entirely know what the philosophy behind mm -hmm. the software is. We don't know what the software can do, uh, but maybe also what it doesn't do very well. And I feel like that is something that um, might get lost over the next couple of decades as we start collecting things and as software ages. Um, so my question would be what your position is on collecting an exhaustive documentation on what the software actually does as part of an architectural archive. Hmm. I think my, as a, as a, as someone who works with archives and who has done some curatorial work, but I am not an archivist, so I have a very selfish perspective. And my, my, my intuition is to say, preserve everything, right? Like keep everything and let scholars make sense of it, right? And in the archival community, I have encountered a little bit of this, uh, I mean, that thought makes them nervous, right? Because it's like, okay, but, but what is everything and, and how do we make sense of it? How do we allow access to, to like meaningful access to, to these things? So I, I think that what, what becomes important is to develop an informed understanding of the types of materials that are produced, right? Like there's like process information as Bernhard was, was suggesting, there's like file, working files, there's the software itself, um, there are final products and so on. Some people would say, okay, what do we preserve? Do we preserve everything or do we, do we create like an open format for capturing the geometry of the final geometry of the artifacts, and that's it. And I think I think you would agree with me that that is not nearly enough, right? That is just a, a, like a final result. But there's so much richness in the process. There's so much frictions generated by the software itself and by the technologies that they, 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 that having access to that becomes essential. So what we are trying to think about is what categories of artifacts, of digital artifacts, belong in this ecosystem of, of, of architectural digital, of born digital architectural information. And how do we think through that through those categories? And, and in a way that is meaningful, that can be cross-referenced with physical records, and that and that can provide a sort of template for, for, for growth. But these are very important questions, very early stages of people starting to address those questions and I think that makes them exciting too right like it's, you don't know I, I would be curious to hear your thoughts about you know, that as well yeah absolutely I mean I think one of the big discussions we're currently having is also the question of what is the original mm -hmm. in digital architecture right and if, if we're talking about open file formats I think that that's the core of the question right what do you lose when you convert it and is it still the original um, also what Bernard Franken just said, because it's, I think it's the same question, right? Have you lost the original when you lost the file, but you still have a screenshot of your master geometry, for instance? Um, and I think that question gets more and more complicated as software ages, as you lose the original version of the software. And maybe you can still open it in a different one, but is it still the same? And I think that's, that's a question where we don't have a very good answer yet, but I think it's a pressing question as we like start collecting thousands and thousands of files um, that needs to be answered. Yeah, and another, another important element in this conversation is the different cultures of record keeping in different offices, right? Like some offices may keep a lot of stuff and others will just, and, uh, and I think 
that that's fine that's okay like because some people want to create standards right and and okay we're gonna have these standards but but i think that the, the way in which firms manipulate digital information is also part of what they do it's part of their unique proposition so so i think we need to develop a a, a, a skeleton of a, of a of a of a structure that allows us to think of these different artifacts in ways that make archival sense um making sure that we are not sort of uh, dismissing important elements of the process and, and yeah yeah I think that's also why I really appreciated you mentioning oral history a lot throughout your talk because we've I mean one of the common fears that we always hear over and over again from people is that the computer makes people obsolete but what we've realized is is basically the opposite you need to talk more to people to make sense of why they structured things the way they did and why they've kept 10 different versions of the same file so i think the need for oral history has not diminished at all right totally yeah totally, totally. Yeah. definitely all right well thank you thank you so much no thank you teresa it's been so great and and, um, and i just wish i could, could visit the, the exhibition it looks fantastic and thank you so much for inviting me to participate and really fun yeah yeah, just one well, <clears throat> uh, idea to add to what uh, Teresa just said about the question of the original. Um, we in the office, we always uh, treated it this way that every manifestation of the data is just a derivative. So mm -hmm. there is no such thing as the original, but there is uh, the original code and then there is derivatives of it. So even if you open it up in a different version, this is another derivative derivative of the original code. So mm -hmm. the only original code is just one and zero, and the rest is just derivatives in in different cascades of manifestations, even the final building then. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. So you would, you would place the building as, as, as a derivative as well. That's super. Yeah. Okay, yeah, um, thanks for, for those questions and obviously for, for the answers, Daniel. And I think um, seeing that is, it is um, seven o'clock, uh, we can end this talk. And um, obviously, first of all, I'd like to thank Daniel mainly for giving this presentation, but also all of the participants that have listened to it. And I mean, you mentioned, Daniel, that you wished you could come to see the exhibition. And I think there could be a chance because <laughs> just good news that the exhibition will be um, extended until June of 2021. So who knows, maybe <laughs> fingers, fingers. Better. <laughs> we cross our fingers. Yeah. yeah. And um, in case you can't come, I mean, um, you already have the exhibition catalog, but yes. for those who don't, uh, I encourage you to buy it. It's uh, as Daniel would probably approve a very great catalog. You can also Frankens uh, and his office's work in here, um, and also the, for example, the architectural software timeline. And quick announcement for the next talk. So um, 9th of December, at the same time, in the same Zoom meeting room through the same link, um, there will be a talk um, or a conversation between Christopher Sharples, who is one of the founders of Shop Architects in New York, um, also part of the exhibition, obviously and Andres Lepic, our uh, museum director, and they will talk about um, extended realities and virtual prototypes for digital mod mod models to visualize um, architectural ideas. And yeah, by this, I'd uh, call it a day. And thanks again, Daniel. Thanks again to the audience. Um, everyone have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Right. Thank you, Lisa and everyone. Stay safe.